Okay, uh, part three of um, today's content is going to discuss uh, youth cultures and also the work of Peter Kelly who talks about uh, youth as an artefact of expertise. And then I'll conclude with um, some more information about, um, if you're interested in these topics, what you can look for. Um, so within youth studies, traditionally, there's been seen as being kind of two separate uh, areas of study. There's the youth transitions that I've discussed already, um, and then also the youth cultures. And mostly these um, areas of research have been separate. And it's only been recently that um, there's been a call to kind of bridge that gap and to kind of show that um, we need to think about um, both of these things at once in young people's lives because they're not all that separate. Um, so I'll go into that a little bit more in a sec. Um, so youth cultures in particular, of you know, the, the kind of leisure practices that young people do, the forms of consumption, um, are seen as a kind of key site where they develop their identity. Um, um, and they've been studied in a, in a multitude of ways. Um, as a place of kind of balancing between hegemony and resistance. There's been studies, you know, that look at mainstream consumption as opposed to subcultural, more kind of um, alternative consumption. There's debates about how um, youth culture can be expressions of authenticity, while others, you know, argue that they're mostly areas of commodification. Um, there's, you know, tensions between whether youth cultures are creative or, you know, allowing people to present a, a kind of version of themselves that they're happy with or whether they're more about conformity. Um, and there's, you know, about those tensions between, you know, individual identities and ideology, the kind of self-identity um, and social identity stuff. So in particular, the, the early, um, early research projects around punk and goth and mods and rockers in the 60s and 70s were hugely influential. They saw the rise of this very concept of subculture being a key way of thinking about um, the way that some young people do this stuff. And what they did, they kind of maintained that distinction between mainstream kind of, you know, mindless dupe kind of consumption. And they pointed to subcultures as being more resistive, more creative, more authentic. Here, things like punk, you know, the mohawk haircut isn't just a fashion item. It's a way of symbolically rebelling against the norms of society. So obviously, you know, there's problems with that. You know, um, it's very easy for subcultures to be co-opted and then sold back at a higher price, that kind of thing. Um, what's interesting, I think, about the subcultural theorists is most of them were insiders. They were, they were taking part in some of these subcultures. And rather than like the more kind of critical theorists, they were actually doing ethnography, going out into the world and, you know, participating and observing what was going on. Um, but that's not to say there's not huge problems with subcultures in, in, the, in previous, dec like in terms of the concept. In previous decades, there's been uh, a rise of um, other ways of thinking about this, whether it's neo-tribes or lifestyles or club cultures, um, many other ways that kind of say that, you know, maybe pointing out to these kind of tiny little resistive subcultures isn't all that useful when the vast majority of young people consume in these other ways. Um, the ways that resistance is configured in these Subcultures is through is symbolic stuff and through rituals. So again, um, you know, wearing a garbage bag as a, a punk, you know, is a way of symbolic symbolically expressing that you feel like you're being treated by gar as garbage. Um, notions of bricolage, where everyday items are reconfigured into um, you know things that mean differently, different things. You know, so using safety pins and stuff like that for um, uh, earrings or whatever. Uh, and the rituals are around, you know doing things that aren't kind of, you know, really appreciated by the mainstream kind of normie world. This way, this is a way of resisting, not in kind of a Marxist way, looking for revolution. It's much more of a way of finding an autonomous space within the way that societies are um, and try, trying to find some kind of autonomy within them rather than overthrowing them. Now, the, what's interesting about um, youth cultures in terms of the way they've been studied as well is that they've, they've also been a key site of moral panics. Um, so there's always, there's lots of moral panics about youth cultures um, and they just seems to, con they constantly happen, whether it's, you know, the, the punks and the mods and the goths back in the 60s and the 70s or whether it's, you know, Marilyn Manson in the 80s, or, uh, sorry, in the 90s or whatever, and heavy metal and rap in the 80s. Um, probably I'm getting too old now to know what's going on now in terms of moral panics, but it tends to be about the sexualization of culture through... Um, female pop stars as one. There's lots of moral panics around digital cultures and all that kind of thing in terms of, you know, Facebook and bullying and that kind of thing. So 
um, youth culture uh, researchers want to kind of look beyond the stereotypes and actually see what these things mean in young people's lives. That sure there might be problematic aspects to it, but um, there's normally a kind of whole lot of other affordances going on that the kind of journalistic moral panics overlook. So there's been a kind of a move in the youth cultural um, realm to kind of, rather than thinking of things as resistive all the time, thinking of them more as a kind of social practice, a way of being in the world, um, a way of developing in your identity that aren't necessarily about resistance all the time. Um, that they're also about, you know, finding other people that are like you to be able to kind of get along with. There's been a real effort in recent times to bridge the gap between transitions and cultures, and that's for a few reasons. Um, one of the ways of thinking about kind of the ways that young people participate in youth cultures is it's kind of a almost um, refuge from the pressures that they face in that youth transitions thing, you know, under pressure to make the right choices, get the good job, study hard, you know, all that kind of thing, that the kind of leisure practice stuff is a refuge from that. Um, and these things, you know, the transitions and the cultures kind of interrelate in that sense. Okay, so I've kind of discussed the kind of main um, uh, ways of thinking about youth in youth studies, kind of traditionally the youth transitions and youth cultures. Uh, I do want to emphasise that those kind of fields are melding and the, the distinction between, between them aren't as important. Um, so one of the things I said at the, in, the, in the first part of, the, of, the, of this week's content is that um, the youth as a kind of age category, it's difficult to kind of render all the people within that category as the same. Um, generations um, you know, certainly face similar economic, political, social conditions and cultural conditions, but you know, people of the same age are never all the same. They you know, have all those kind of distinctions of class, race, gender, ethnicity, you know, location, geography, what country they live in. But one way of thinking about youth as a kind of more broader term is through Peter Kelly's work about how he sees that youth become what he calls an artefact of expertise and how they're constantly in positions of institutionalised mistrust. So this relates to kind of some of the moral panics around young people. It also relates to kind of some of the key psychological um, attitudes towards young people, that this kind of, um, you know, development psychology stuff they need to be um, developing in the right ways. What Kelly highlights is there's a lot of ideology, ideology uh, within those ways of thinking that isn't questioned too much. Um, he problematises the very role that experts play in, the young, in young people's lives, and this includes youth studies researchers. Um, so Kelly's work has pointed out that maybe much of the research um, into and with young people can be used in these governmental ways that kind of um, is used to try and produce a neoliberal subject. So he shows that much as the interventions into young people's lives, that you know, when people are categorised as at risk, um, that this can actually create a self-fulfilling prophecy, which is very similar to the labelling theory that um, he would have looked at in some of the kind of basic deviance um, and criminology stuff. So there's an over-reliance on kind of quantitative measuring and then a really under-reliance of getting an understanding of the actual qualitative problems in young people's lives. Um, and Kelly, and work influenced by Kelly and, and Foucault in general, um, wants to problematise the way that young people are positioned as these things to be moulded because for this kind of Foucauldian position this is a form of governmentality, a way of moulding people into kind of good neoliberal citizens, you know, good moral citizens and things like that that may not necessarily be for their own good, that may work for, you know, those in power or those uh, with more knowledge. So Peter Kelly's work is particularly influential for thinking about the position of young people um, within the broader um, spectrum of how knowledge is gathered and how it's diffused and how it's used to regulate people. Okay, so I've pretty much got through the kind of explanatory stuff that I wanted to talk about. I just wanted to briefly point out that um, if you're interested in um, youth issues and youth studies, that there's a Newcastle Youth Studies group, so please check out that webpage. There's also a, um, a Facebook group that we um, semi-regularly posts um, stories and research about young people, and there's some, um, there's some uh, profiles of the people that are members of the group there. Also, there's a whole um, subject on youth, culture and risk, and you can see the kind of weekly breakdown of what we look at there.
Um, and what this subject does, um, it um, pretty much showcases the research of the Newcastle Youth Studies Group. So the first couple of weeks are a broad introduction to youth studies. And then we look at it for a few weeks um, uh, around, we look at uh, a few weeks on um, some of the research projects that um, researchers are doing here at Newcastle. Um, so if you're interested in that stuff, um, please have a look at it and think about doing the subject. Okay, thank you.